from a uh, conversation overheard between uh, Pontius Pilate and Joseph of Arimathea. Pilate says, Joseph, I really don't understand. You're one of the richest men in the region, and you've spent a small fortune on a new tomb for you and your family, and you want to give it to this man, Jesus? And Joseph's reply, it's just for the weekend. <laughs> Grace, peace, and mercy from God the Father, Jesus our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. Pray with me, please. Lord, as your people we gather today, we come looking for rest, we look for uh, your comfort, we look for your peace, but most of all we look to the cross and for the salvation that you've provided for us through your son Jesus. It's in his name we come today, amen. So I don't know whether you, you can't really see it from where you're sitting, but my little, my little button here uh, says, party like it's 1517. I remember that. I remember that. So on this weekend, we uh, certainly celebrate the life and work of Martin Luther, known as the Great Reformer. And we're known as Lutherans because we believe, teach, and confess the interpretations and explanations brought forward through the work of Luther and those others that were working with him. Now, the earliest well-known reformer was a man named John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was an English philosopher, a theologian, a biblical translator, a reformer. He was a Catholic priest and a seminary, seminary professor in the early 1300s, 200 years before Luther. He came to the conclusion that the Roman church was in error and stated that the scriptures as the only reliable guide to the truth about God. And he further maintained that all Christians should rely on the Bible rather than the teachings of popes and clerics, and that there was no scriptural justification for the papacy. Time travel now to the late 1300s, early 1400s, and enter Jan Hus, or Hus, if you so pronounce it that way. He was a Czech theologian, priest, and philosopher, who also became a church reformer and actually influenced Martin Luther uh, quite a bit. Now Hus, his big thing was, he was opposed to the selling of indulgences by the church. Of course, something that Luther really, really hammered on. Hus would not recant from his beliefs, so he was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, and as a reward, he was burned at the stake for heresy. Enter Martin Luther. Doesn't look like him, does it? Who on October 31st, 1517, delivered his 95 theses to the church in Wittenberg. And whether he actually nailed those to the church doors or not doesn't really matter in the context of everything that happened after. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole history of uh, Luther and the men around him uh, who helped all of his efforts. But today, I'm going to quote from Luther's last sermon given on February 15th, 
1546. Luther had been in this movement now for the better part of 30 years. He's been excommunicated. He's been hunted down as a criminal, had to change his appearance and use a fake name. And yet, through it all, God had him survive. The Lutheran movement had gained much strength and some very influential followers. None of them from Rome, however. His last sermon is based on our gospel reading. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. He's addressing a very large crowd on this Monday. And he begins, and I quote, This is a fine gospel, and it has a lot in it. Let us talk about part of it now, covering as much as we can and as God gives us grace. The Lord here praises and extols his heavenly Father for having hidden these things from the wise and understanding. That is, he did not make his gospel known to the wise and understanding, but to infants and children who cannot speak and preach and are not knowing and wise. But to the world, it is very foolish and offensive that God should be opposed to the wise and condemn them, when, after all, we have the idea that God could not reign if he did not have wise and understanding people to help him. Luther continues, So the Pope, too, wants to be a very wise man, indeed the wisest of the wise, simply because he has a high position and claims to be the head of the church, whereupon the devil so puffs him up that he imagines that whatever he says and does is pure divine wisdom, and everybody must accept and obey it. And nobody should ask whether it is God's word or not. In his big fool's book, he presumes quite shamelessly to say that it is not likely that such an eminence, meaning himself, could err. But to combat this, we must learn what this means. As Jesus said, all things have been delivered to me. In other words, he says, I must rule, teach, counsel, give orders and command in my church. And when he said that, Christ openly confessed that he is true God. For no angel nor any other creature can say that all things have been delivered to him. If you have my word, then stick to it and pay no attention to anybody who teaches or commands you differently. Moving forward in the sermon. In times past, we would have run to the ends of the world if we had known a place where we could have heard God speak. But now we hear this every day in sermons. Indeed, now that all books are full of it, and the preacher speaks of it in the parish church, you ought to lift your hands and rejoice that we have been given the honor of hearing God speaking to us through his word. Christ says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. It's as though he were saying, Just stick to me. Hold on to my word and let everything else go. Luther concluded his message this way. Lo, this means that the wise of the world are rejected, that we may learn not to think of ourselves as wise and to put away from our eyes all great personages, indeed to shut our eyes altogether and to cling only to Christ's word 
and come to him as he so lovingly invites us to do and to say, Thou alone art my beloved Lord and Master. I am thy disciple. This and much more might be said concerning this gospel, but I am too weak, and we shall let it go at that. Three days after delivering this sermon, Luther dies. Four days later, he's buried in Wittenberg. Does the Reformation die with Luther? Absolutely not. But I want to go back to the opening, when I, what I talked about, and submit that the Reformation or reformation of people and the church's teachings actually date way, way back much further. In Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he changed the course of human history. And certainly, the church now had a new foundation. The word reform is defined as to put or change into an improved form or condition. And reformation as the state of being reformed. We have been and continue to be reformed by the grace of God to be his disciples. As Reformation people, we're called to be changed and improved following his example and obeying his command to make disciples of all nations, to serve as Jesus did in our homes, our neighborhoods, in our communities, and yes, right here in his church. And his promise? I will be with you to the end of the age. Reformation is alive and well today. God's movement in and through us will never stop. Luther stated, here I still stand. We must say the same. Thou alone art my beloved Lord and Master. I am thy disciple. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.